You know, I have a feeling, Robert, if, if one looked up in the dictionary, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that they'd probably be a picture of Led Zeppelin. Well, it's very kind of you. Uh, <laughs> well, I, my question, I want you to be reflective. Uh, because you're not anywhere near the end if, if you're half lucky in God's grace. That's right. But looking back over it, what's been the best of it? The best of it? You said there'd be no trick questions. I think maybe the best of it is that our time initially when the whole thing was opening up was there were no charts, there were no maps. There was no structure. There was no conditioning. We were flying by the seat of our pants into this thing. There were many people around us, especially from the Bay Area, San Francisco. There were fantastic bands, musical units, but we had no, there was no etiquette developed yet. There was no, the last thing we were was uh, a good bet to have on a talk show or anything <laughs> like that. You know, it was a, a time to be proud of our music and also now that I know now the way that everything's gone, look where we are, you know, in Warner Brothers, you know, the home of Once Upon a Time Atlantic Records and all right. the great stuff. There were no rules, things were being developed and, and the journey, there was no, nobody could plot it. It was just, what do we do now? Oh, maybe we'll play somewhere bigger. You know, I mean, it was just like kids going from playing in the youth club behind the church to playing small clubs. The acceleration into another place was crazy. I mean, a little like being thrown in as an astronaut in, into the cosmos. Well, at least getting out of the ship halfway across the journey, yeah, because you had no idea. Nobody knew what was going on. During some of what shall I call the most publicized things of that era. Led Zeppelin is breaking through. All those stories about riding motorcycles in hotels, wrecking hotel rooms, throwing television sets out of windows and all of that. Now, I know that some of that was hyperbole, and maybe it's like overstated, but some of it was true. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it, do you regret that? Well, I can only apologize for the motorbike in the hallway, but it was a tiny, meany one. Mm -hmm. And it fitted very nicely in the elevator, uh, not being smug. But uh, the other stuff, actually, to be perfectly honest, I think I must have missed that. Um, <laughs> but obviously, there was a frenetic energy, and it was not always other bands that were in the middle of it. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it was particularly a magnificent achievement. Well, true or untrue, you said, I think half-jokingly, I must have missed some of that. But the, when you sing, particularly when you have the kind of range that you have, you can't stay up all night, every night, and perform at that level. No. So did you find yourself sort of slipping away at some point in the evening and saying, at least I have to get to sleep? Well, you know, the thing is, a voice is not going to, a, it's a muscle, and it's a funny-shaped thing anyway. And um, yeah, I had a lot of trouble with my voice along the line. I was in Australia once, in Mel Melbourne, I remember waking up and we'd sold out a kind of some huge stadium. The stage was on wheels, so they got it so that if we had 10,000 people, that was fine. But if it was 12, they could wheel the stage back with a tractor pulling it and then back and then back and then right. back. And as the day went on, more and more people arrived and I couldn't speak. And I went to a doctor and he hit me with some adrenaline and stuff like that. And I, I mean, I turned several shades of different colors and slid down the wall, covered yeah. in perspiration and sang the gig. Now that's the last thing a singer needs to do. The damage that you can do. One time I went to see a voice specialist in London, in Harley Street. He was pretty highbrow. He had a, he had a desk with a little button underneath so that as you walked in, he hit the button and the curtains all closed around you and he had a kind of dish on his head and put a camera down my throat and he said, he said, in six months time, your voice won't even be able to show signs of surprise. 
he said, it's over. And that was 28 years ago. So, I mean, the number of times you think you've had it, you think it's gone, or... And, then, and there's quite a lot of singers who, who were so hard on themselves that they did lose it forever. Do you consider music a profession or a craft or an art? Well, art's a heavy word, you know. Um, I think craft is the term I would use, the middle term, yeah. Yeah, because I think you grow into what might initially be an, an infatuation with the idea of entering something very special, right. very daring. And as a kid, as a young teenager, I, I was drawn to the lights because I came, like so many kids out of my generation in Britain, we came from a kind of very grey post-war, you know, the kind of the residue of a lot of pain and strife. So I suppose kids in the mid-50s in Britain were just starting to wake up after the, you know, parents coming back from the war or, you know, being attracted to the footlights and the entertainment and the smell of a venue and the kind of, um, the anticipation in a crowd. I love that. I thought that was an amazing thing, you know, um, because I've, I've been a music fan and a fan of all things that are interesting and occasionally unique all my life. So I'm, all, I'm always a member of the audience and an entertainer, mm -hmm. really. So yeah, it's a craft. Sometimes it's clever, sometimes it's a real flop, you know. Well, I'm particularly interested in what you said about Great Britain in the wake of World War II. Mm. And I think a lot of people have forgotten, some don't know, partly because they weren't alive. It was a rather austere period for Britain, at least through most, if not all, of the 50s. Yeah. And into the 60s, too, yeah. I mean, um, into the early 60s. Um, and also, I, now I understand more about my, my father's generation. You know, um, there were so many people that didn't come back, and, and every family had some member of the family who, who just didn't return. So those that did, my father and my mom, they, got, they were, they drew themselves out of that, in that post-war sort of grayness. Uh, my father was aspiring. So I think now I can understand why he wondered what in God's name I was doing, <laughs> turning my back on a, um, a career that was around the corner beckoning me. And I chose this other road and he was bemused. He just didn't get it at all. And when I think about what he went through before he, he had a wife and a kid and the years that he spent, I can quite understand why he was quite sort of, um, I would say probably slightly disappointed, you know, initially. Did he talk about the war with you? He never ever talked about it. Like so many of my friends of my generation, their fathers never, until um, his very latter days and then he came out with some real corkers, some very funny stories, mm -hmm. of which obviously he was giving us the funny stuff. But um, yeah, that generation didn't say much. That generation didn't say much. Now, do you think that's the reason, or not, that so many of rock and roll's biggest stars, most successful people, came out of the post-post-World War II generation. Do you think that was part of it? I think definitely there was a kind of grim, you know, determination to get on mm -hmm. from our parents' generation. But for us, we didn't have any real measure of what they had been dealing with. So we were just going, hey, let's go. What's happening? Wow, there's little Richard. Little Richard, you know. <laughs> Um, this guy banging the piano with a pompadour who was driving us mad, you know, so good. And Bill Haley, as he did these tours, Bill Haley and the Comets, who you'd say would be quite tame, really, by the standards of what followed, were just, they were setting the world on fire. Uh, I looked at them and I went, that's what I want. I want to be like that. <laughs>